Hello, this is the seventh video I'm doing on multivariable calculus challenge problems. The problems I'm doing are from the calculus book by Rogoski and Adams, though I'm sure you can find many of these problems, very similar problems, in other calculus books. So even if you've got another calculus book, I hope you find use out of this. We also do Mathematica demonstrations to illustrate these ideas and to make them more dynamic. So what we have here in this problem is we have a cycloid, which is this red curve that you see here, of radius r, meaning generated by a circle of radius r that is rolling along the x-axis. You follow a point along that circle, starting at the origin, and it will traverse a red curve like this. In this case, r happens to equal 2. It's given by these parametric equations. I'm not going to derive these equations, but they can be derived using trigonometry x and y are both functions of t. t is the parameter. You can imagine t to be time. x equals f of t equals r times t minus r sine t, and y equals g of t equals r minus r cos t. It's problem 11.2.12, problem number 12 in section 11.2. The main thing to do there is part b, show that one arch of the cycloid is generated by the circle of radius r has length 8r, arc length 8r. I added a part here, part A, find the distance traveled or arc length function, S equals a distance of T along the cycloid generated by the circle of radius R. If we can do part A, then we can do part B. We'll just plug in T equals 2 pi to find the distance traveled or arc length along one arch of the cycloid. All right, um, the way I like to think about this initially is to First, think about the speed of travel. If you imagine the parametric equations as describing the motion of this point, this black point along this red curve. Um, most textbooks approach the speed by, def by um, deriving the formula for arc length first, treating it as a function of time, and then differentiating using the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the speed. But I hope it's fairly intuitive to you, and maybe you know from physics, that the speed here is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares of dx dt and dy dt. If you know anything about velocity vectors, this is the same thing as the length of the velocity vector for this parametric curve that we see here. So in this case, looking at these equations that you see here, this is going to give us square root differentiate f with respect to t, you'll get r minus r cos t. That thing has to be squared. Differentiate y with respect to t, you will get a positive r sine t, and that has to be squared. We can factor the r's out of these parentheses and square them, and then factor them out of the square root. Square root of r squared, since r is positive, would be r. That's since r is positive. In general, it would have to be the absolute value of r. And what's left inside the square root? Think about squaring 1 minus cos t. You'll get 1 minus 2 cos t plus cos squared t. Square sine squared t, and you get, of course, sine squared t. Of course, as usual, this is equal to 1. So we get 2 minus 2 cos t. The 2 can be factored out, and we can write square root of 2 times r times square root of 1 minus uh, cos t. And that will be the speed as a function of time, the speed of the motion of the black dot along the red curve as a function of time, not just for as t goes from 0 to 2 pi, but as t continues on for higher and higher values of t. Integrating this, will give you the distance travel function. The speed really is the same as what you might say is ds dt, where s is the arc length, the distance traveled, as a function of time. Integrating it will give you s. I typically like to write this as a definite integral. Um, you might write the integral of speed of tau d tau as tau goes from 0 to t. You can write it as an indefinite integral and just get the right constant of integration, we need to make sure that at time 0, t equals 0, that we have not traveled any distance. s must be 0 when t equals 0, and this is one way to do that. So we can write in abstract form s as a function of time 
like this involving an integral. But then the question becomes, how do you actually do the integral if you want to simplify this? Is it possible? It's not always possible with these kinds of problems. In this one it is. There is, as you might guess, a trigonometric identity that you can use. Uh, it is a trig identity you theoretically could memorize. Um, but if you didn't, you know, it's impossible for pretty much anybody to remember all trigonometric identities. In fact, you might say there are infinitely many of them, so it's impossible to memorize them all. But there are certain trig identities that are more important than others. One is what you might call a double angle formula. I typically remember it like this uh, for the cosine function. Cosine of 2 times some angle, call it theta. One way to think of that is as 2 cos squared theta minus 1. That's one version of the double angle formula for cosine of 2 theta. Another way to write this is what I would get if I replace cos squared theta with 1 minus sine squared theta. If I do that, think about it with me here, I get I have to multiply the 2 through the parentheses here. I get 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1. I could write a 1, and I'd also have a 2 times negative sine squared theta. I can write a 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. Okay, so I can quickly see that, and I can also, if I want, I can also solve these equations for cos squared and sine squared. Think about that with me here. If you solve this first equation for cos squared theta, you could say cos squared theta by adding 1 to both sides and then dividing by 2 is 1 half plus 1 half cos 2 theta. And you could solve this equaling this for sine squared theta by subtracting 1 from both sides and then dividing both sides by negative 2 to get sine squared theta is 1 half minus 1 half cos 2 theta. And actually these are common enough in integration problems that I happen to remember both of these. Okay, and I think in future videos like this we or we have to do some integrals involving trig functions, they will often involve cos squared theta and sine squared theta and they will be useful to use. And I can use one of them in this one. I can use the second one here up in here, what I can essentially do is take this uh, thing and multiply both sides by 2 and also replace theta with uh, 2 theta with tau. In other words, theta would be tau over 2. What would I get if I do that? So s, if I do that, I'd have square root of 2r integral from 0 to t of the square root tau becomes 2 theta, so theta becomes tau over 2, I would get, um, I have to have an extra 2 in there as well because I multiply both sides of this by 2, I get square root of 2 sine squared tau over 2. Okay, and that's nice because now we're going to take the square root of a square. Technically speaking, in general, that's the absolute value of the thing. Let me go ahead and factor the square root of 2 out, so I get square root of 2 times 2, square root of 2 is 2. 2r, two integral from 0 to t of the absolute value of sine of tau over 2. Now many times in math, for example, solving differential equations, you end up getting absolute values involved and you say, well, maybe I can get rid of the absolute values and I don't have to worry about it and I get the right answer anyway. That does happen sometimes. But sometimes you do need to pay attention to absolute value signs, and you do need to pay attention to them here. For example, if t happened to be between 2 pi and 4 pi. However, if t is between 0 and 2 pi, which is going to be good enough to help us solve part b, then I can get rid of the absolute value signs. If t is between 0 and 2 pi, meaning when I do the integral, tau is between 0 and 2 pi, that means tau over 2 will be between 0 and pi, and the sine of such a number is not negative. I can get rid of the absolute value signs. So if that's the case, if I'm in this situation, I can write this as 2r times the integral from 0 to t of sine of tau over 2 without absolute value signs. 
if I'm in this case. Okay, let's just see what happens when I finish this. Do this integral. If you can't quite do this in your head, you might want to do a substitution. But what you end up getting is negative 4r cosine of tau over 2. That's a tau there, sorry. Tau over 2. Tau goes from 0 to t. When you plug in t, you get negative 4r cosine t over 2. And when you plug in 0, you get negative 4r cosine of 0. Um, cosine of 0, of course, is 1. We got two negatives making a plus. We can write this as positive 4r minus 4r cosine t over 2. That would be the formula for s. The distance traveled function, or arc length function, is a function of time, ultimately, when t is between 0 and 2 pi. I can now use this to answer part b, show that one arch of the cycloid has length 8r, meaning if I plug in t equals 2 pi into this, I should get 8r. What is s when t is 2 pi? It's 4r minus 4r cosine 2 pi divided by 2 is pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so this is 4r plus 4r is 8r. So that does verify now part b. And we have done part a partially. Can we do part A more in depth? Well, yeah, we could con continue considering cases. Uh, if t is between 2 pi and 4 pi, um, the formula with the integral still applies, the formula with the absolute value signs there. But as far as actually calculating it, well, I could break up that integral from 0 to t when t is bigger than 2 pi to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of tau over 2 without absolute value signs, just like before, plus the integral from 2 pi to t. Careful here, this would be negative sine of tau over 2 because if t is between 2 pi and 4 pi, then for this integral, tau is between 2 pi and 4 pi as well. Tau over 2 is between pi and 2 pi. Sine of such a number is negative, not positive. So its absolute value would actually be this. And this would actually be a, a positive quantity here because the sine would be negative. This we already know is... Um, well, let's see, if I factor it out of 2r, this is going to be 4r right there. Multiplying the 2r back through, if I like, um, I get 8r. And then 2r times this integral, uh, I'm going to get back to actually a plus sign, plus 4r cosine of tau over 2. There tau goes from 2 pi to t, where t is between 2 pi and 4 pi. So this is going to give us 4 r cosine of t over 2 minus 4 r cosine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. So the two minuses will give us a plus 4 r. Ultimately simplifying to 12 r plus 4 r cosine of t over 2. And as one way to check this, you might think about what happens when t is extreme here, close to 2 pi or 4 pi. You let t go to 2 pi from the right here. t over 2 goes to pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. This approach is 12r minus 4r, which is 8r. is consistent with that. When t is 4 pi, this should equal 16r. Or, yeah, twice this, 16r. t is 4 pi. 4 pi divided by 2 is 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is a positive 1. So I do get 12r plus 4r is 16r. It's looking consistent. And yeah, I could continue going piecewise here, but you get the idea. Okay, so essentially we have solved the problem. Now we're going to go to Mathematica and visualize what's going on here with that. All right, now we're on to the Mathematica portion of video number seven, where we're going to see an animation of a rolling wheel generating a cycloid, and we're going to look at distance traveled, arc length, and Mathematica. Again, you don't have to know Mathematica code or 
have Mathematica available to appreciate what we're going to see here. I think it's going to be enlightening even if you don't. But if you do have Mathematica and you're interested in learning more, you can certainly copy my code here. This code, for example, is going to generate the static picture that was on the piece of paper. And there it is. So this wheel has radius 2, r equals 2, and as it moves and as this point moves on the circle, uh, it generates this cycloid curve. We can look at animations of this if we put it within a manipulate. So this is an animation of the cycloid. B here is the right end point of the time interval that we're plotting this over, and we can see the wheel moving and the point moving and the red curve being generated by the motion of the black dot. I can change the radius of the circle and see how things change. It makes a bigger cycloid if the radius is bigger. I can add vectors to this. Now, technically speaking, vectors are not in chapter 11 yet. Uh, in fact, we won't see them until chapter 12, but I like adding them to the picture anyway. And what we see here, first of all, you see the pink magenta colored vector, that arrow that is tangent to the curve, that's the velocity vector. Um, it points in the direction of motion at any instant in time and is zero at the cusps. We also see this orange vector that is the acceleration vector, the rate of change of the velocity vector. One interesting thing about that is that it's pointing always at the opposite side of the circle. <clears throat> Actually, those are not exactly equal to those vectors. I made them twice as long as they should be. I multiplied them by two just so we could see them more easily. All right, so that's the animation that we can see. Now, that, how does Mathematica handle this problem symbolically? It does turn out to be different than how we did it by hand a, a little bit. Uh, the speed function is this that we saw, and it's not quite as simplified as much as we might like, even though I use slash slash simplify. That's okay, I can simplify it in my mind and write it like this, and I can do this indefinite integral to try to find the distance traveled function. Now, remember that an indefinite integral is going to have a constant of integration. You have to pick the right constant of integration to make sure it's the distance traveled function. Actually, Mathematica doesn't give you a plus c. It assumes you would add the plus c on, but it, it really is supposed to be there, even though we don't see it. It is writing the answer in a different form involving the cotangent function, and actually this function like this is not the distance traveled function. Uh, we're going to have to adjust this up or down by a certain fixed constant. Now, if you try to plug in t equals 0 to this, into this, which is what this code will do, you get indeterminate. You get you're essentially dividing by zero. The reason is cotangent of zero is zero. Cotangent is cosine divided by sine, and sine of zero is zero. However, even though that's undefined at zero, it actually has what's called a removable discontinuity there. You can take a limit of that as t goes to zero, and you do get a quantity that's not plus or minus infinity. You get negative 4r. So it seems like if I if I um, add 4r to this thing, I should get the distance traveled function, and that's what I did down here. However, just like in when we did it by hand, this formula is not going to actually work for all values of t. I'm calling it dist first piece. If we try graphing this along with the speed function, which is what we're doing here in this picture, so this is no longer a picture of the parametric curve itself. This is not the cycloid. It's a graph of the speed function in red here, down here, and the distance travel function in blue. However, the distance travel function is actually not correct once you get past t equals 2 pi. Okay, this first piece is correct, but the second piece is not. This thing, by the way, is supposed to be a jump discontinuity. It's not really a part of the graph. Um, so what we have to do is we have to make an adjustment. That can happen in Mathematica. Um, using a piecewise formula like we've got here. I can take a limit of this thing as t approaches 2 pi uh, from the left to help me realize I really should add on an 8r to this when t is between 2 pi and 4 pi, which is what this code right here is doing. And I could continue adding more pieces to this if I wanted to plot it up to 6 pi or 8 pi or 10 pi. Uh, there's also a command called which w-h-i-c-h that can be used to do this. Anyway, once you make that adjustment, then we can get the right kind of graphs for both the distance traveled and the speed. 
Now, one thing I want you to notice here, so now look at the blue curve is now continuous, is there is a definite relationship between these graphs. The red graph, the speed, is the derivative of the blue. The values of the red are giving the slopes of the blue, which I try to relate the graph of the red down here, the speed, with this line segment up here, which is the tangent line to the blue graph at the given point. The slope of that red tangent line should be the value of the red graph. You could pause the video at any point and try to actually literally measure that. The value of the red graph here is approximately 4. You could try to estimate the slope here to be approximately 4 as well. Also, you could, if you look closely, you can see some shading under the red graph, slightly light blue shading. That's because the blue is the integral of the red, and in particular it's the integral from 0 to t for any given value of t. So the output of the blue at a given moment in time is the area under the red graph. This value up here is around 13, a little less than 13, so the area of this lightly blue shaded should be a little less than 13, though that might be difficult to tell. You, I put the grid in there to help you estimate that if you want. It looks like the each of these boxes here would have area 1 times 2, area of 2. So if you tried to add up the boxes, you should get an area of approximately 13 here under the red graph. Okay, and we can continue that for other times as well. So I, I think this is really, really informative, and I hope you do too, and I'll continue using Mathematica as we do these challenge problems in the future to help us understand what's going on better.